And what's happening in Surah Al-Najm is we're going to see a tafsir of Wal Quran al Majid. What makes it so majestic? When Najmi Ida Hawa, Ma Ladna Sahibukum Wa Ma Hawa. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a streaming service that brought you closer to the Quran? Bayana TV strives to do just that, with over 2,000 hours of enlightening content centered on the Quran and Arabic. Make learning a habit. Tap now to get Bayana TV for yourself today. So, the, the, before I get into the surah itself, I need to give you a couple more preliminary concepts that I need you to be, to be aware of. You remember that Legos analogy I gave you? I'm going to give you this picture. There's no text. There's just this picture. Um, the idea is that there are strands within a surah. Strands within a surah. So I'm going to list some strands for you. Some of the more common strands in Makkan surahs. Okay? And they all get stitched together. So one of those strands are uh, the, the signs of Allah. That's one of the strands that you find a lot in Makkan surahs. So the signs of Allah could be in the mountains, the signs could be inside of ourselves, the signs could be in history, etc. Right? That's one. The second is prophetic history. Prophetic history. Okay? Now, prophetic history, I'm not talking about nations and their destruction. That's separate. Prophetic history is like, you know, when the angels came and spoke to Ibrahim alayhi salam that he's going to have a child. That's a small episode of prophetic history. Or when Musa alayhi salam spoke to Allah on the mountain, that's prophetic history, right? So that's the second strand now. A third strand is judgment day and the afterlife. Judgment day and the afterlife. How many have we got so far? What are they? What was number one? Hmm? Signs of Allah. Two? Prophetic history. What was three? Judgment day, right? Another strand is going to be the fall of nations. The fall of nations. Like the, 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 the fall of Fir'aun's nation. The fall of the nation of Ad and Thamud and you know, so on. Right? So the fall of nations is yet another strand. Right? Then another strand is comforting the Prophet. This is a very important strand that's in the Makkah Quran. Comforting the Prophet. So the Prophet will be told, وسلم, ignore what they're saying. Be patient with what they're saying. Allah is with you, etc. Right? So comforting the Prophet is a constant strand that's going on inside of uh, uh, you know, uh, these surahs. And then these are the main ones. There's some smaller ones, like for example, uh, the, ba uh, the basis of, uh, how do I describe this? I you can call it spiritual morality. Spiritual morality. Let me explain what that means. You know how like in Islam we have technicalities like how do you make wudu, right? We have technicalities for ghusl. We have technicalities for how do you slaughter an animal. Those are very technical and specific things. But honesty, kindness, you know, being, being fair to one another, being good to parents. Those are not technical. That's a part of what? Spiritual morality. So the technical, the sharia, that stuff came mostly in Medina. But when, when Mecca, in, in Mecca, when the Quran was talking about good deeds, it was basically in the realm of this spiritual morality. That's, that's what it was talking about. How many strands do we have now? Six. Another strand, the Quran itself. Or actually, let's make it broader, revelation itself. And let me explain what this means. Revelation is three things. Revelation is three things. The angel who delivers it is part of the machinery of revelation. What is the angel delivering? The message, that's part of revelation. And who's receiving it? The messenger, that's also part of revelation. So there's three pieces to revelation. There's the, 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 the deliverer, the angel. The, you can call it the message or the book. And the messenger, the recipient. All three. That is one of the subjects, one of the strands in Makkah Quran, dealing with that in one way or the other. The reason I brought this up right now is I want you to know something about Surah Al Najm from the outside before we go inside. Surah Al Najm belongs to a group of surahs between 50 and 56. You should know that. 
between what surahs? 50 and 56. These are all Meccan surahs, all of them. And they all have strands that build on each other. So Allah will give you a little bit of one of the strands in Surah Qaf, and He'll give you some extra, the same strand will come up somehow again in Surah Al-Dhariyat, then it will come again in Surah Al-Tur, and then it will come again in Najm, then in Qamar, then in Rahman, and then in Waqi'ah. 50 all the way to 56. Now I'm going to talk to you about one of those strands. One of those strands is the Qur'an itself. Revelation, the Qur'an itself, is one of the strands that you find in Surah number 50. It comes again in 51. It comes again in 52. It comes again in 53. And we're in 53 right now. So I want to show you what's happening with this strand. Why do I want to show you this strand and not the other strands? Because we're dealing with section number one of the surah. And section number one of the surah is actually about the Qur'an, revelation itself. So let me tell you what happens. In Surah Al-Qaf, Allah swears, Qur'an al majid He swears by the Qur'an full of majesty. The glorious Qur'an, the majestic Qur'an. He doesn't explain what makes it majestic. You should ponder that yourself. But he's dropped an idea in Surah Qaf that he's describing the Qur'an as what? Majestic. In Surah Al-Dhariyat, he says, this Qur'an is as true as your ability to speak. He's basically saying, if you contemplate the human ability to speak, you will realize it wasn't given as a product of evolution. And you will also realize its limits. And the more you contemplate human speech, the more you will become clear that this cannot be human speech. It's a pretty remarkable statement. So there's a proof for the Qur'an in my own tongue. My own tongue is proof for the Qur'an if I contemplate it. That's in Surah Al-Dhariyat. Surah Al-Tur now takes a few extra steps. The Surah Al-Tur now says, here are all the things they say to say this is not from Allah. All the allegations against the Qur'an, all collected in one place in Surah Al-Tur. You're not a mind reader, you're not a sorcerer, you're not insane. Are they saying he's a poet? Are they saying he's crafting it and editing it himself? Well, you know what? If this is human speech and it's one of these categories, why don't you just bring something like it? Then they should do it. They should produce something like it. So what you're seeing now is a, is a progression. The proof, Surah Al-Dhariyat was proving the Qur'an, Surah Al-Tur is proving the Qur'an, but Surah Qaf was not proving the Qur'an. Surah Qaf was just saying it's full of majesty. It was describing the beauty of the Qur'an. And what's happening in Surah Al-Najm is, we're going to see a tafsir of Wal Qur'an al-Majid. What makes it so majestic? What are some things that you can think about and I can think about that make it majestic? So keeping track of these strands is helpful because Allah is building an idea and other strands will be built, but this is the first one that we're going to dive into, okay? Now, this is another important concept. Before we get into the surah, let me get comfortable because I'm a pindu. I sit with my knee up. I need you to understand this concept. Istidlalul ma'qul bil mahsus. I'll explain what this means. A lot of the Qur'an given in Mecca will start making more sense to you if you understand this concept. It's a very important concept in the Qur'an. So, sometimes Allah will talk, today in this surah Allah will talk about the star. The star. You can see the star with your eyes, yes? In Surah Al-Dhariyat, He will talk about the wind. The wind. Can you feel the wind? Yeah, you can totally feel the wind. In Surah Al-Tur, He'll talk about the mountain of Tur. Did people see the mountain of Tur? Did they experience the mountain of Tur? Yes, they saw it. Allah will talk about things that you can experience from the five senses. That is al, 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 al mahsus Imagery. Imagery, you can imagine it, you can feel it, you can experience it. But he's talking about it and he's using it to teach you something that is beyond the five senses. He's teaching you something about the unseen through it. He's teaching you something, be, you know, Powerful. Like for example, actually, if I get into the example, it'll take too long. We'll take this surah as the example itself. Allah will be talking about the star. But he's using the example of the star to talk about something much more spiritual. 
So actually, the star is just a stepping stone. It's just a device for something much larger. You with me? So that's how we're going to under... When you see one of the physical phenomena in the Quran, any signs of Allah, you should ask, why is that there? What, what's the significance of it? What spiritual truth is connected to this image? One of my favorite examples is Wattini wa zaytun. Wattin was a fig in the olive. Fig in the olive, which is a reference to mounts, you know, mount, uh, the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, which reminds of the legacy of Jesus. But you don't have to say Jesus. You can just say what? Wattin? Especially with Zaytun, and the entire history of Jesus comes up. Waturi Sinin, that's the history of Moses, Musa alayhi salam. Wahad al Balad al Amin, that's Makkah, which is the, the history of Ibrahim alayhi salam and Rasulullah alayhi salam. So prophets are being talked about by just a few images, you see, and their entire legacy, that entire spiritual truth is encapsulated in just a couple of words. That's part of the style of the Quran. It's sophisticated, it's rich. And that's what we have to pay attention to when we, if we're going to make um, sense of the surah. Now we're going to get into the surah itself. First things first, there, uh, the reports we have about the surah, they're not conclusive, but most likely or high likelihood, this was given to the Prophet ﷺ in the fifth year. So he's been a prophet for five years when this surah came. And by this time, they've started to become very hostile. Some Sira historians argue that the first three years or so, or two years, the Prophet ﷺ was giving da'wah, but he was giving it one-on-one. -on -one. He wasn't going in public, and he wasn't out in, in the marketplace and things like that. It was one-on-one. -on -one. People were being talked to about Islam, and it was kind of underground. And then from three, four, and five, things started becoming more public. And as they started becoming more public, the, the response of Makkah started becoming more and more and more aggressive. So we're now in the middle of the early part of the aggression of Makkah when this surah came. An interesting event happened. Now, the, what, one of the things that the Quraysh used to do when the Prophet used to recite the Quran, they used to start making noise. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Or somebody would start singing a song. Or they would pay women to start a concert while the Quran's going on. So in the middle of the market, women would start dancing and singing and all the crowd would go over there. Don't listen to this Quran and create distraction when it's being recited. So you can win. So the Quran was being ignored, right? And if, if somebody hears the Quran, they're like, they start making noise so you don't hear it, right? But then, five, two years into this aggression, Allah gave the Prophet ﷺ Surah Al-Najm. وَالنَّجْمِ إِذَا هَوَى مَا ضَلَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ وَمَا غَوَى وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى And something strange happened. The Prophet was reciting this surah, the whole surah, at one time. It's a long surah. He recites the whole surah and nobody stops him. Nobody stopped him. Nobody made noise. They were all like, huh? What? And they started listening. And check this out. عَنِ ابْنِ عَبَّاسٍ أَنَّ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ سَجَدَ بِالنَّجَمْ Ibn Abbas reports that Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did sajda at the end of Surah Al-Najm because the last ayah of Surah Al-Sajda, Surah Al-Najm is a sajda. So he fell into prostration. وَسَجَدَ مَعَهُ الْمُسْلِمُونَ And the Muslims did sajda with him. وَالْمُشْرِكُونَ And the Mushrikun fell into sajda. The Quraysh fell into sajda. وَالْجِنْ وَالْإِنْسْ And jinns and human beings. Anybody who heard the surah fell into sajda. Even the mushrikun who used to make noise. This happened in what year reportedly? The fifth year. وَعَنَ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ أَنَّ النَّبِي قَرَأَ سُورَةَ النَّجَمْ فَسَجَدَ لَهَا فَمَا بَقِيَ أَحَدٌ مِّنَ الْقَوْمِ إِلَّا سَجَدْ The Rasul Sallallahu recited Surah Al-Najm. He did sajda himself. No one was left in all of Makkah that in the audience, except that they fell into sajda, except one guy. One guy didn't do sajda. فَأَخَذَ رَجُلٌ مِّنَ الْقَوْمِ كَفَّمْ مِّنْ حَصْبَاء أَوْ تُرَابْ فَرَفَعَهُ إِلَى وَجْهِهِ Instead of doing sajda, he took some dirt and he put it on his head and said, that's enough for me. I'm not going to put my head down on the dirt, the dirt will come up to my head. He had to, that was his reaction. But everybody else, fell in, even people who don't believe, 
fell into sajda momentarily. Okay. So now, yakfini uh, hada. He said, "This is enough for me." قال عبد الله فلق فلقد رأيته بعد قتلة يعني بعد قتلة كافرا متفق عليه. Some say this was Umayyah ibn Khalf. Others say other things. Then we saw that this person was killed later on. He died a violent death. Anyway, this is a big problem. Because the Quraysh, the elders of Quraysh, keep spreading, don't listen to this Quran, this man is insane, this man is wasting your time, he's just a poet. And now everybody has done what? So they can't keep campaigning against Islam when they all sort of Islamed for a few minutes. This is looking pretty bad. This is very bad. So they had to come up with a solution to this incident. Because this is not just one person or two people. This is everybody. So here's what happens. And this is my understanding of these events. You're free to disagree. But to the best of my ability, this is how I understand these events. They had to come up with a solution to this problem. And in this surah, later on, Allah will say, Allah will say, have you seen your false gods? They had different idols, right? Three of those gods were named in the Quran. Lat, Manat, Uzza. Three of them, Allah named them. And said, you think these are Allah's daughters? And you know what they did? They went around and they said, no, 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 no. We didn't do sajda because of the Quran. The Prophet was saying, Lat, Manat, and Uzza are good. He said, Inna shafa'atahum turtaja. Their intercession will work. They can save you on judgment day. So the Prophet compromised and he was okay with three of our gods. He even mentioned them in Surah Al-Najm. Did the Prophet mention those three? Did Allah mention those three gods in Surah Al-Najm? Yes. Did he say that they're going to intercede on your behalf? No, they made that up. And this became famously known as the Satanic Verses. This became, oh, the Prophet momentarily agreed with Lat Manat. He never agreed. They had to come up with an alt campaign, alt facts campaign. They took three of the words in the surah, made up their own ayat, spread them, and the rumor spread far and wide to some of the Muslims who were living in Abyssinia, heard the rumor, that's how good their rumor machine was, and they said, oh, the Prophet has compromised with the Quraysh, you can come back now. He's made a deal with them, because if you accept some of their gods, you've made a deal. So some of them started coming back because of the rumor. That's how powerful the rumor machine was. And I won't dignify the idea of the satanic verses and whether it's legitimate or not, because for any real academic, not even a believer, any real academic that studies the subject, looks at the text, looks at what they're claiming, it doesn't add up at all. The, the most plausible explanation, which is absolutely convincing, is this incident was too big of an embarrassment for them. So they had to create a smear campaign against the Quran. And that's what they came up with. You know, so this is this is one incident that you should know about that was related to Surah Al-Najm. Okay, now, by the way, something I didn't tell you, I should have told you. These notes, they're like in Arabic, because I want you to feel bad. No, 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 they're in they're in Arabic in a box. The box is usually for me, not for you. I'll explain it. But sometimes there are things in English and they're not in a box. Those things are for who? There for you. So don't feel bad about this. Don't feel a little bad, but that's okay. This is for me. But for you, inshallah, that's coming. Okay? Now, let's begin with the first ayah of this surah. By the way, my goal today is to try to reach ayah number six. Inna lillahi wa inna lillahi raji'un. Let's see how far we get. When najmi idha hawa. Allah says, I swear by the star as it falls. I swear by the star as it falls. That's an easy translation so far. I'm going to share first with you what did the Muslims say about this ayah historically. This is in Qurtubi, Tabari, Ibn Kathir, diff different tafasir. These are some of the opinions about these ayat. Mujahid wa thuraya idha saqatat ma'al fajr wal Arab to sammi thuraya najman wa in kanat fil adad nujuman. This is going to be important. He's saying by Suraya. Suraya is not the name of an Arab uh, khala. Uh, Suraya is a, is a cluster of stars in the sky. Uh, in English, we call them the Pallades. The Pallades constellation or the Pallades cluster of stars. Okay, The Arabs used to call it Suraya. 
And they're saying, by the constellation or the cluster of stars called Turayya, as they fall, as they fall. So I'm not going to explain this yet. Just keep this in your head. It's referring to a specific star or a specific group of stars as they fall. We'll figure out what that means soon. Mujahid says, no, one najm is actually referring, it's saying star, but it's talking about the Qur'an. وَالْقُرْآنِ إِذَا نُزِّلَ لِأَنَّهُ كَانَ يُنَزَّلْ نُجُومًا Najama or Najama or Nujima actually in Arabic means to give something in installments. To give something in installments. So Qur'an came in what? Installments. So each installment is like a star shooting in the sky. Like each installment is a star falling. That's how Mujahid saw it. You see the beautiful contrast, comparison between those two? It's a similar oath that you find in Surah Al-Waqi'ah when Allah says, فَلَا أُقْسِمُ بِمَوَاقِعِ النُّجُومِ I swear by the falling of the, and the placement of the stars. Right? And so that's a very powerful, beautiful image because the, the, the stars are the only light in the middle of darkness and the revelation of Allah is light in the middle of a world that's full of darkness. Right? And Allah controls every star and its movement, and Allah determined every ayah and its revelation and when it came. So that was the opinion of Mujahid. Al Farra, Nujumu Sama'i Kulluha Hina Taghrubu. This is all of the stars in the sky when they fall or when they start disappearing from the horizon. Uh, Hassan says something similar Allah swear by the stars as they disappear. Uh, Hassan also said this might be referring to stars on Judgment Day when they all start falling. I swear by the star as it falls or as it will fall, meaning the, I'm swearing by the time when all stars are going to start dropping out of the universe. Because Allah will describe, you know, the kawakibun tatharat, other places in the Quran, all the stars are going to disperse, you know, and tumisat, they're going to be erased and wiped out. So that could be a reference to that. This, these are early opinions. In the najma ha huna al zahra li anna qawma min al arab kanu ya'budunaha. Some say this is a star, a specific star called Zahra, Zahra, and the Arabs used to worship it. So Allah is swearing by it as if he owns it. That's not your God, it has a God. So that, that's what it's a reference to. And then finally, this is actually the weakest of the opinions. Najm huna huwa nabat, nabt alladhi laysa lahu saq. It's, najm is also used in Arabic for grass or low plants. But that's, and, and as, they, as the wind makes them go down, so the grass as it goes down, but that's not really uh, viable in, in uh, coming up with the rest of it. Now, I've actually mentioned this already, so we can move on. Uh, interesting opinion, very rare opinion. Sometimes among our mufassirun, there were those who really loved the Prophet wasallam, and their love of the Prophet influenced their tafsir, their thoughts about the Quran. So they would see, oh, Allah is talking about the star as it falls. This must be talking about the Prophet Muhammad as he came down from the Mi'raj, the star as it falls. So that was also one of the opinions that was, uh, that was further. Ja'far ibn Muhammad Ali ibn Hussein uh, said this. Okay, uh, so now, this is where I need you to use your imagination a little bit. So don't worry about the screen right now, just listen to me. The ancient Arabs before Islam they were really in touch with the sky. Obviously, they lived in the desert, and in the desert, the sky looks very different than what the sky looks like now with the world full of lights and electronics and, and pollution. It, you know, there are photographers from around the world that come to Texas. There's a certain spot in Texas that has the best night sky in the world. And they come there, and there are no lights allowed and no flashes allowed, and they come to just take pictures of the sky. But that was the normal sky for the Arabs back in the day. And we see a few stars here and there. But actually, if you go in the desert sky, there's not a place where you don't find stars. It's actually very different night sky than the one that we see. It's, so we actually, the, the tragedy of modern technology is that for the most part, we have not experienced the night sky. So when Allah is talking about the star as it falls, we have much less of a connection to that than the ancient Arabs did. Now, the ancient Arab, I want you to just imagine you live in that time, before Islam, back in ancient Arabia, right? Not a lot of cities, people, not a lot of lights, 
People love coming out at night because the day is excruciatingly hot. And the only real beauty they have to stare at is what? The stars. And they love traveling at night because it's safer, because you're cloaked, and because it's cooler, and they can move faster. So they traveled quite a bit at night too. And وَبِنْ نَجْمِهُمْ يَحْتَدُونَ And they used to use the stars for navigation. Now the thing is, you might not know this, and I didn't know this because we're not in touch with nature, but the stars actually move through the seasons. They actually move. And over the course, if you're looking at, remember I told you Pallades, the constellation? That at one part of the year, as soon as Maghrib happens, you can see it at eye level. And as the year progresses through the night, it moves above your head. And another part of the year, the, the first time you see it is right above your head, and it moves down slowly over the season to eye level. So actually, this constellation rises and it also falls. Interestingly, oh, I, yeah. Interestingly, the word hawa, the word uh, hawa actually means rising and falling. Al huwiyu dhahabun fin hidarin, wal huwiyu dhahabun firtifa'in. Linguists argue that huwi from Hawa, the same uh, letters, is actually something going down. And Hawi is actually something going up. So movement downwards and upwards is captured inside Hawa. And what's really cool is these stars, half of the year they were rising and the other half of the year they were falling. This is why even the idea of falling really fast is also used in the word Hawa. Like they use it for the, for the eagle when it swoops down. Hawa til iqab. You know, like it jumps down from the mountain and it dives down to capture its prey and then it gets up. The, the eagle, when it does that, that's actually called Hawa also. Okay, so that's a little bit about the meaning of the word Hawa. But now let's dig a little deeper. I want you to know something that happened in ancient Arabia called the Anwa' system. The Anwa' was poetry before Islam. All of it was about the stars. Like there was an entire music department dedicated to songs and poems about what? The stars. And in those poems, they used to use the word najm a lot. Which word? Najm. And they used it for Thurayya. They used it for Pallades all the time. Sometimes they would say najm Thurayya. Sometimes they would say najm, but they used it all the time. And you need to know that. So when, they, when the Arabs heard the Qur'an say, Wan Najmi, they were thinking, you're talking about Pallades? You're talking about that, that constellation? And they used to, the reason they developed this literature is they used to pay attention to where they can find Pallades because it will tell them which season is coming. Is rain coming? Oh, Pallades is above our head. Is winter coming? Oh, it's right down here, etc., etc. So they would actually keep track of it in their poems and pay close attention to it. And Allah is using that culture that they had in the opening ayah also. We'll see why he does that. But right now I need you to know, if you were an ancient Arab and you never heard about Islam and you heard when Najmi Ida Hawa, you're like, yeah, I do that. Yeah, I, I, know that. I know what that's about. Yeah. You know, so th there would be a connection to you. It's not a spiritual connection to you yet. It's just something that's part of your culture that Allah is drawing on, right? Now, uh, this is, these are just examples of the word najm being used as thurayya. So we'll, we'll skip these quickly. But I, well, I do want to get you to the summary. Okay. In the summer, thurayya, najm, rises. So when they see it rising, they see it at, at the horizon, at the sunset, and then they see it rising, that means it's summer coming. And when it's falling, that means what's coming? Winter. So the poet will say, oh, I see Thurayya falling. It's, it's making hawa. You, you better tell the boy to get the axe. You know what that means? What is he going to do with the axe? What do you think? He's going to cut wood, which is, means he's going to make a fire because it's going to get cold. You get it? So they would actually consider this a connection to the change of seasons. And they would make preparations for the future based on now this is really awesome because Allah is also saying you're so used to preparing for the coming season 
because you look at the sky and now this revelation has come from the sky and it's time for you to prepare for the coming season of the afterlife. You see? So the physical image of a Najmi Ida Hawa is now being tied to what is this revelation is not a joke. You have to take it very seriously. You know? So he's tying the revelation together to this cultural phenomenon of the Arabs. Hey guys, you just watched a small clip of me explaining the Quran in depth as part of the Deeper Look series. Studying the Quran in depth can seem like a really intimidating thing that's only meant for scholars. Our job at Bayan is to make deeper study of the Quran accessible and easy for all of you. So take us up on that challenge. Join us for this study, the deeper look of the Quran for this surah and many other surahs on BayanaTV.com under the Deeper Look section.